All right, everybody, uh, welcome back to the electromagnetism notes. Uh, today's section is on something called electromagnetic induction, which um, basically comes from uh, discoveries by Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry, who posed the question, um, if moving charges through a wire can generate a magnetic field, can we then use a magnetic field to uh, generate a current? And uh, it turns out that we can uh, through this process called electromagnetic induction. And electromagnetic induction is basically the generation the generation of a current or voltage due to a changing magnetic field. And so what Faraday discovered um, was that there's lots of ways you can induce a current. Uh, and for example, we can talk about the induction coil and, and things like that that we've seen in class. Um, what was most interesting to note was that um, you could move the coil or you could move the magnet around this induction coil. It didn't matter which way you, could move, you moved it, either way you would generate a current. So what was most interesting to note was that um, the direction of change didn't matter. Or that is to say, at least, whether you increase the strength of the field or decrease the strength of the field, either way you generate a current. Um, what does change, we'll see later, is the direction. And so this shows that magnetic fields are not made by, um, or sorry, magnetic fields do not create electric currents on their own. Rather, they're only generated by changes in the mag field. And so if we're changing the magnetic field, we're going to uh, potentially induce a current. So an example of this comes from, uh, or could be, uh, take a solenoid. So if we look at the solenoid and we have a magnet, a bar magnet like this, that we move towards a solenoid, um, the first thing I want you to notice is that we're going to generate a current, whether the bar magnet is moving towards the solenoid or away from the solenoid, either way. But in order to predict the direction of the induced current, we use Lenz's law. And Lenz's law says the induced magnetic field opposes motion. And by motion, we really mean a change in the magnetic field. So if you look at this example on the right, you can see we've got a bar magnet with the north pole here, and we're pushing this bar magnet into the solenoid. So as the north pole of the solenoid moves to the right, there's an induced magnetic field inside the coil that resists that change. It pushes back against that bar magnet. Now, strangely enough, when we take, try to take the bar magnet back out, when we pull the magnet away from that, then the field inside the solenoid, the induced field, changes direction and seems to want to prevent that magnet from leaving. So it tries to push the magnet away on its way in, and then as soon as it tries to leave, it tries to prevent it from leaving. And you see, in each way we go, we change the direction of the current um, whenever it moves. And so Lenz's law really is just an application of conservation of energy. And so if you think about it, whenever you move this magnet, you're creating or you're generating a current. Well, that current represents electrical energy, and that energy has to come from somewhere. Um, in this case, it comes from the mechanical energy, the kinetic energy, if you will, of that bar ma magnet moving back and forth. You have to physically apply a force to that magnet in order to push it through and generate that current. Now, the direction of the current through the coil you can find using our second right-hand rule. And you remember the second right-hand rule? That was the one that applied to um, solenoids. And so with the second right-hand rule, if you point your thumb in the direction of the north pole of the magnet, then your fingers wrap around in the direction of current flow. And so we can use this to determine the direction of the current through a solenoid. So... Um, as we said, uh, current, is, electric current is generated by a changing magnetic field. 
But when we talk about magnetic field, to, to get a kind of a clearer picture, we really actually need to talk about something called magnetic flux, which of course is related to field, but a little bit different. And magnetic flux really refers to the density of magnetic field lines. And so if you think about a magnet that's generating a magnetic field, it has field lines coming out of it all the way, in all directions, I should say. And so if you have a loop of wire, only a certain number of those field lines are going to go through that loop of wire. And you can imagine that the number of field lines that actually make it through the wire are going to depend on a number of factors. And the first one, maybe most obviously, is going to be the strength of the magnet. So the stronger the magnet is, the more field lines are coming out of it, the more of those field lines will happen to go through uh, that loop of wire. But the second one is the area of the loop. You can imagine that the larger the loop is, the more field lines it will catch, the more field lines will go through it. And the last one is maybe not um, so obvious, but it's the orientation of the loop. To the field. And so by that I mean if you had a loop of wire and a magnet pointing towards it, if you were to rotate the loop of wire, uh, there would be certain times when lots of field lines would go through the loop and other times when that would essentially drop to zero. And so magnetic flux is really at a maximum when the loop is perpendicular to the field and it's at a minimum when the loop is parallel when it catches as few of those field lines as possible. So there's a few formulas we need to know in order to actually calculate the amount of, um, uh, of voltage produced or EMF produced. And the first is uh, the formula for magnetic flux. Now the symbol for flux is uh, the Greek letter phi. And phi is equal to B times A times the cosine of theta, where um, phi is our magnetic flux or the amount of field lines that go through the loop. B is the magnetic field strength. A is our cross-sectional area measured in uh, meters squared. And theta, again, is the orientation. Now you'll note the units for flux are tesla meters squared or simply called Weber's. Now to, to calculate the amount of EMF that's generated, uh, we can use something that's called Faraday's law. And so the amount of EMF generated by um, a changing field is equal to negative N times delta phi over T, where, of course, E is our EMF, N is the number of loops, uh, delta phi is our change in flux, as noted, and then little t here, of course, is time. Now, you'll notice that this formula has a negative sign in front of it, and the negative sign just relates back to Lenz's law, which told us that when we induce a magnetic field, this magnetic, um, this induced field is going to work in opposition to the, uh, to the changing field. And so that will allow us to predict our current. Okay, so we've got a few examples here. I want you to just hit pause for a quick second and just go through, work through the problems and see if you can solve them. And then uh, go ahead and press play when you're ready to see the answers. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to assume that you definitely paused the video and now you're ready to see the answers. So in this first example, uh, we've got a square loop sitting in a field and the sides of the loop are 2.1 centimeters or 0.021 meters across. And so to calculate the uh, flux, this would just be equal to B times A times the cosine of theta. <clears throat> now, um, in this case, since we're perpendicular to the field, this will simplify simply to B times A. And so the area will just be um, side by side. And so 1.50 Teslas 
multiply by 0 0.021 meters squared. And this works out to be approximately 0 0.00066 Webers. Okay. Now, our next example, uh, we've got a circular coil and it has a diameter of 1.8 meters, which means the radius would be equal to 0 0.90 meters. And so to find the, uh, to find the, um, the EMF that's generated, you know that EMF is equal to negative N delta phi over T. Now, I just want to remind you that we know that phi is equal to uh, phi is equal to BA cos theta. So there's three ways that we can generate a, an EMF. We can change the strength of the field, we can change the area of the loop, or we can change the orientation. Now in this case, we're starting off with a field that's 0.25 Teslas, and then that's being reduced to zero. So really what we're doing is we're changing the strength of the field. And again, this uh, field is perpendicular to the coil, so my co my um, my orientation doesn't affect the final answer. And so this is equal to, in this case, negative n times delta b times a. My area is constant, my orientation doesn't affect things, and this is all divided by time. So the number of loops is going to be, uh, I've got negative 50 times my change in field, which is 0 minus 0 0.250. And my area is going to equal pi r squared. So pi times my radius squared, which is 0 0.90 squared, all divided by the time, which is 0 0.1 seconds. And this works out to be approximately 320. And the units here are volts because we're measuring an EMF. All right, last example. Now this one's a little bit trickier because we have to not just figure out the amount of EMF induced, but you can see in question B, it, we have to figure out the current. So I'm going to draw a little picture just to kind of help me uh, visualize this. We've got a circular loop of wire that's um, placed in a magnetic field that is into the page. So I'm just going to draw a little field into the page here that looks... So I'm just going to draw a little field here into the page. I'll just draw it like this, let's say. and I've got my loop that's sitting in there, kind of like that. Now the field starts off with a strength of, uh, let's see, 0 0.020 Teslas, but then it's reduced. So I'm gonna draw kind of just a weaker field, I guess, maybe like this, with the same loop sitting in it. And you can see this is like my initial field and now my final field is 0 0.010 Teslas, still in the same direction. Okay, and a reminder, the radius of this loop here is 2.5 centimeters. Okay, and a reminder here that the radius of this loop is 2.5 centimeters, so 0 0.025 meters. Okay, so to calculate my EMF, EMF is gonna equal negative N delta phi over t. Um, and in this case, it just says a singular circle or a circular loop of wire. So I have to assume it's just a singular loop. And so this is going to equal negative n times, again, a change in field times area divided by time. 
And so the EMF is going to equal negative one loop multiplied by B final minus B initial times the area, which in this case is pi r squared, all divided by the time. And this final answer ends up being right around 2.0 times 10 to the negative 4 volts. You can see not very much because a single loop on its own is not going to generate much voltage. So what you'll notice is that in the end, this uh, negative sign ended up sort of coming out in the, in the wash and not really affecting things. And there is one way to use that in order to predict the direction of our current, which we could use for this second one here. Uh, and maybe we'll take a look at that in class. But for now, I just want you to think about what happened in this case. We had a field that was going into the page, fairly strong, and it was reduced so that it was still into the page, but not as strong. And so overall, the reduction of this field meant that our change in field, our overall change in field, was out of the page, or in this case, negative. Since the changing field is going to, uh, the induced magnetic field is going to resist that change, then we know that it is going to work such that it goes into the page. And so if you point your thumb into the page, you'll see your hands curl around uh, the loop in a clockwise fashion. And so overall, we know that our current is clockwise. So the direction of current flow would be clockwise. All right, that's it for this lesson. Um, now I'm sure there's a, probably a few questions, in particular if you look at the direction of the current flow, how to figure that out. That's definitely a trickier concept. So that's something we'll, re we'll revisit in class and get lots of practice with then. All right, you're all done.